John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We can expedite this if someone's willing to quote it. I'll step aside and let you. Okay. No. No. She, she got a little prelude earlier because I gave her my text and I said, you know what that one is. And well, I'll just stop right there. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but okay. <laughs> there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. A ruler of the Jews. That's important. He was, he was a leader. He knew their history. He knew their story. Are you hearing me? The saying came to Jesus by night. This is just a commercial for those of you that think you want to be in ministry. People will call you at night. People will have needs at night. If you get too tar tired to make it to your prospective ministry, that's as probably as far as you go. If you can't make it for song service, if you can't make it for youth, if you can't, well, don't get mad at the pastor calling on you when it's convenient. Ministry is not convenient. It's a calling. Amen. And that was free. All right. Came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, which means truly, truly, I say unto thee. Now you have to understand something here. Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. He knows their history. So you've got to stay with me and don't think you've heard this before. You haven't. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? Now remember, this is a, an intelligent person. And be born. Jesus answered, he uses the term again, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You want to go to heaven? You better hear what Jesus has to say. He qualifies this and says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not. Don't get weirded out. Don't let it get complicated. Marvel not that I saith unto you, unto thee, ye must be born Again, Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, help me and allow me to walk in your unction and your spirit, God, to be moved, Lord God, in your holy word, to bring across this understanding and this thought, God, that it will help the hearers, those that believe. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to speak for just a few moments tonight on breaking the birth order curse. Alfred Adler, a 19th and early 20th century Austrian psychotherapist and founder of individual psychology, believed that your birth order leads to differences in your makeup as a sibling. While that really isn't my whole subject tonight, it is uh, quite a study. I will point out a book that I read a number of years ago, and if you have children, it would be something that would be beneficial for you to read. His book entitled Outliers contains some very interesting compelling information on the subject of birth order. There's a multitude of books and articles and uh, writings out there that talks about the effects of your birth order in your family. There's even uh, some psychology on what they call the syndrome of the firstborn. In fact, whatever your birth is, after studying some of this out, I realized that they pretty much, no matter when you're born, want to give you a syndrome of some type. <laughs> we all have birthdays, which gives us birth orders. And while birthdays are exciting when you're young, they do tend to help you get older. It's statistically proven that the more birthdays you have, the longer you live. And so our birth may determine some things for us, our race, our looks. In the words of Erica, some people are more fortunate or unfortunate than others. Our place of birth. 
our culture, our name, your social beginning, whether you're wealthy or not. In fact, you can have research done today by sending in a sample of your blood where they can tell you about your lineage. Now, this isn't all that out of whack because if you've read your Bible, there's a few slow reading spots that I call them where they go through the genealogies. And all the Bible readers say amen. So when I was young, my last name was actually a point of contention. But it's funny, as I've aged, my last name's actually pretty cool. After having traveled and lived overseas, I can also say definitively that I'm glad I was born in America. Our birth is our natural beginning. It's what sets us on our natural way. And I've heard some complain and even blame their life and its course on the things associated with their birth. Well, if I'd have been born into money, well, if I'd have been born with both my parents, if only my last name were, and so whether whichever side you take on that, we have a, a endless list of blames. But all that aside and giving heed to the text that I read to you where Jesus is speaking about being born again, Jesus gives us an open door to change our criticism of when and what we were born into and gives us the wonderful option of being born again. That being said, you have to understand that the reason Jesus would do that is because there is something greater that we have access to when it comes to what Jesus said. Paul makes a statement in Romans chapter 8, verses 14, 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Right. He's talking about something here. But ye have received the spirit of adoption. He's talking about being born again. When he talks about bondage, it's you are bound by sin the moment you're born. But I like what he uses, the term he uses here about but ye have received the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit of adoption, the feeling of affection. Adoption is an amazing concept. It's, a, it's something that transcends natural birth. It shows unexplainable love and confidence which pertains to a child that's really not your own. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So basically in, in, in the biblical concept, we can be born slaves and be born again sons. Amen. Are you hearing me? In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul goes on when he talks about this and he says in verse 19, now therefore, talking about those born again, ye are no more strangers or foreigners born someplace else mm. <laughs> belong to another culture or creed but fellow citizens with the saints and I like this term of the household of God you, you get born in this thing <laughs> you don't join a real church you're born into a church mm. right, hallelujah hallelujah the Bible does speak in the Old Testament about firstborn children, and specifically firstborn sons, that there are rights and privileges. In fact, it was so prominent that if you remember, even one of the ten plagues enlisted uh, the firstborn, if you know your Bible. In a sense, our family structure today and how we do things 
does create that syndrome that Adler spoke about, if you will, with the firstborn. We can say it's the problem with the firstborn, or we can stop and realize it's the environment we create with our firstborn. <clears throat> Some of the practices we have. If you've got a firstborn, you know that you have a picture of every thing they ever did. Mm -hmm. Their first words. I mean, it was an in sound that was unintelligible, but you know they said dada or mama. You got a picture. You picture of their first steps, a picture of their first birthday, a picture of their first shoes. You, you, you document everything. Their first haircut. Or the first time that little girl's got enough hair to glue that ridiculous little bow in. Are you hearing me? So, you do that, but then you have the second born, and while you can open up your picture box and you've got thousands of the first born, you look over at that little handful you have of the second born. It's just kind of the way it went because their first were your force first, and your, though your second born is their first birth. It's your second. So you don't quite document it. So sometimes it can become overlooked. But in all of that, we kind of do something to the firstborn that it's taught to expect a lot of attention and preeminence. We made a big deal out of everything, so they think they're a big deal. And they get a sense of entitlement. They start to believe that they are the center of your universe. They start to get the idea of a strong self-importance even to the point of getting easily offended. So they not only expect all the attention or a lot of attention, they actually kind of get to the place of demanding it because we created by our environment the importance of them being first. And we put the preeminence on the first birth. And so we kind of create that little monster. So after that first one is born and the second one is born, we kind of start making amends and we start making minor adjustments and we start kind of turning a blind eye to some of the antics of that little monster we created when the second one comes along. Are you hearing me? Because we want to exist with this monster we created. All that being said, and I'm not off my subject here, listen to me. In the Old Testament, the firstborn was entitled to the birthright. Entitled to the blessings their birth order provided. Special privileges and advantages belong to the firstborn son of Jewish children. According to Deuteronomy 21, 17, the firstborn was entitled to a double portion. In fact, the leadership authority passed on from the father to the firstborn son. It was not challenged. It wasn't questioned by anyone except God. There's an interesting trend that we find throughout Old Testament scripture and it's a startling trend that's found in regards to this subject of first and second birth. In fact, we find out right off in regards to Cain and Abel that when they come before the Lord to sacrifice, that God accepts Abel's sacrifice and rejects Cain's. In Genesis 4, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, And Adam knew wife, Eve his wife and conceived and bare, bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, firstborn, big deal. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. One was a shepherd and the other basically a farmer. 
But the Bible goes on to say in verses 3 uh, and 5, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the first things of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. You've seen it. You make a big deal out of the second boy, and the first boy's like, because we see here that God passes on Cain's sacrifice. And he makes a big deal about the second born sacrifice. We're immediately introduced in our Bibles to a birth order issue and attitude. The first thing we notice is that the firstborn, he's mad. His countenance is fallen. He's offended. His feelings are hurt. And his attitude is changed because he's so used to what I do, you get excited about. But the problem is, and those of you that know your Bible know, that he did not obey what he was supposed to do. You damage people when you make a big deal out of disobedience. And so what happens here is we've got a Firstborn that's not good at rejection. He's the firstborn. He's the firstborn. He's used to all the attention and the privileges. And he's had all the attention from mom and dad. All the pictures. And all of a sudden, after all that attention, God steps over. God overlooks him and accepted and respected the second son's offering. To Cain, this was a travesty. To Cain, this is why this is this is this is unacceptable. I'm the firstborn. Things come to me. I am the firstborn. I'm the first son. And this upsets his apple cart because he has the right of the firstborn. Cain doesn't understand what's happening. He's not getting photographed. He's not getting the accolades. They haven't added any pictures to the collage. And sadly, this, uh, this situation leads to the first bloodshed killing. It is so upsetting that the firstborn killed his brother. Cain literally murders his brother because of a disobedient sacrifice being rejected. Bloodshed over a birthright. Cain can't accept that the second took priority over the first. It was not just Cain and Abel will we have a situation like this. In Genesis chapter 16 and 17, we find the story of Abraham and the firstborn birthright that goes on here is thwarted. Abraham's age has caused him and Sarah to take their childlessness situation and take it into their own hands despite the promises of God. And we know the story of how Sarah took her Egyptian maid and said, you know what, Abraham, uh, uh, I, let's just go ahead and take it in our own hands. I'm going to send Hagar unto you. And we know that Ishmael was born. So Abraham and Hagar have accomplished according to human ability, the natural ability, the task of providing a natural firstborn son. But something happens in verse 16 of chapter 17 of Genesis, when God speaks to Abraham, he says, I, I, I will bless her and give her a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations and kings of people shall be of her. He's, he's making a promise here. God is saying, you know, you're doing all this and you went unto Hagar and you did it on your own. But understand, Sarah is going to have a son. I'm going to bless her. There's going to be Many children, in fact, nations and kings of people shall be of her. So Abraham, Sarah, y'all jumped ahead and naturally did what you wanted. But I'm not finished. I'm God. Now Abraham almost got confused because he's thinking, well, what are you doing? Ishmael's my firstborn. You, you can't make promises of a second born because the first born has privileges the second born doesn't have. There's a birthright in place. So Abraham literally, if you read the, read, read the chapter, is calling for, out to God on Ishmael's behalf. He's stepping up for the right of the first born. 
But again, God steps over the firstborn. He breaks through the barrier of the rules and the rights of the firstborn because God has a purpose and a plan for the secondborn. In Genesis 17, 19, and God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish, he uses the word here about Isaac that he doesn't use about Ishmael. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Listen, Abraham, you had a firstborn. Uh, you overrid in the natural, and you went ahead and had Ishmael. He's your natural firstborn, but I'm going to give you a secondborn son to represent the spiritual side of things. You, you may have done the natural, but I'm going to step in with the supernatural. And in your age, when you should be passed, I'm going to show you who's God, and I'm going to show you where the power is, and I'm going to create a covenant birth. God is doing something supernatural in and for that second birth. It will be unexpected, unexplainable, and unprecedented. God speaks to Abraham about the two births in Genesis 17, 20, and 21. As, listen, for the first birth, as for Ishmael, I've heard thee. Behold, I'll bless him, and I'll make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceeding exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. I'm going to bless the first birth. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, the second birth. Mm, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. God is declaring again, I'm going to step over the first birth. And give you a second. I'm stepping over the birth order. The birthright. And I'm going to give you a second birth. I'm going to give you a second birth. That's going to be more powerful than the first. I'm moving past the firstborn. To bless you. And be in covenant with a second birth. The covenant's going to be with the second. Not the first. So we see that God stepped over Cain. In the first birth. And he stepped over Ishmael first birth. But if you look even further in Genesis in chapter 41 verses 15 to 52 and unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came which Asenath the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On bare unto him and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh for God said he hath made me forget all my toil. This is important. Listen. Listen. And all my father's house and the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Two sons. The first, the first boy's name, the first birth's name was cause to forget. Forget my toil, forget my trouble. The second born is cause to be fruitful. <laughs> the firstborn was to cause him to forget all the wrong that had been done to him. We all know his story. It's a brutal story. He went through a lot to get where he ended up. And he's just said, I'm going to give you this firstborn and his name's going to mean to forget all the betrayal of everything that you went through. To forget all the pain and all the struggles that, 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 that you went through. But the second was to make him fruitful in that land of affliction. What am I saying? God is saying your second birth can make you fruitful in the land of affliction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful because this world we're living in. Anybody got any stuff going on? Anybody face any affliction? Anybody face any trouble? So God is letting us know he can give us two things. He can cause us to forget the trouble and the affliction that we face and allow us to be fruitful in the face of affliction. Did you hear me? You can be fruitful in the midst of a struggle. Amen. You can still be fruitful when you face affliction. Affliction is not abandonment. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Listen, I don't care what they place on us next week. It really doesn't matter what they do next month what restrictions or 
unconstitutional rules that they lay upon us, God can still cause us to be fruitful in affliction. God can cause us to be fruitful even in the land of affliction. God can still have a revival in the middle of a mess. He, he can still bring out a birth when everything's falling out. He has a plan in the middle of your trouble. I'm, I'm here to tell somebody, I'm here to tell you, I'm here to let somebody know that no matter what you face, God can cause you to be fruitful. He has a promise in the midst of your affliction because God can step over barriers and bless you. God can transcend the rules of the birthright and say, I'm going to bless who I will bless. Now listen, in order for Joseph's sons to be blessed, Joseph brought them to his father, Jacob. In Genesis 48 and 5, it says, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee in Egypt, are mine. That's what it says. Listen in, Grandpa. This is good. Oh, wait a minute. I'm one too. Okay. Yeah, we got a couple around here. They're mine. You imagine that for just a second. As Reuben and Sibian, those were his real children, they shall be mine. Jacob literally adopts <laughs> Joseph's children as his own. His children will now include two of his grandchildren. That's right. I'm, I'm going to break some barriers here. I'm going to step through and do some things here. Ephraim and Manasseh are mine. So as Joseph brings him to Jacob, the new parental authority, in Genesis 48, in two verses here, 13 and 14, it says, And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left, and Manasseh in his left hand, towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. Now listen. And Israel, remember, Jacob had his name changed. You, I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of things that get your attention, but if you're not reading the Bible, you're missing some beautiful stuff. So, and he brought them near, and Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. He knew what he was doing. Jacob is basically crossing his arms as he's laying hands on the boys. He's switching the blessing order. Jacob is literally again passing over the barrier and the rights of the firstborn to give it to the second because he had power with God and with man. Jacob is a special individual. You see, when he stretched out those hands, those were the hands that prevailed all night. Those were the hands that stuck to the fight all night. Those were some blessed hands. Those were some renamed hands. Are you hearing me? He used the hand that prevailed all night, and he reached across and said in Genesis 48, 15, and 16, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk. Now, we done talked about them. The God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He's talking about all of it. Bless the lads and let my name be named on them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. What's he saying? We're going to transcend some barriers here and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So when he crossed his hands, Joseph got a little concerned. Okay, maybe, maybe dad's got a little, come on, we all heard, I hear it all the time, oh, you're getting kind of old. Yeah, dad, dad maybe, maybe he's a little confused and he's getting old and, and Joseph's a little, maybe, maybe he's messing up and don't realize it. So in verse 17, it says, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand. He, he tried to remove it from Ephraim's head. 
under Manasseh's head. He was trying to fix the order. <laughs> and Joseph said to his father, no, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Oh, put thy right hand upon it. Put the hand of power on the firstborn. The firstborn has the rights. The firstborn gets the double, bl the, 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 double portion. The firstborn gets the blessing. And it says, and his father refused. And he said, I know it, my son. I know it. He says it twice, Brother Lawrence. He shall become a people, and he shall be great. The firstborn's still going to be great. Still going to be taken care of. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's talking about breaking some barriers from the first birth to the second birth. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In these shall Israel be blessed, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Jacob passed over the firstborn to bless the secondborn. The same hands that held on to the angel until he would be blessed, uh, stretched forth. The same hands that struggled all night and refused to let go. The same hands that reached uh, for that injured thigh that was touched. He, Jacob reached out those hands and began to bless the second born over the first. He mixed up the birth order. He broke through the barrier of the birth order. He blessed the younger over the elder. Both were blessed, but the younger got a double portion of the blessings. Are you hearing me? Okay, why did all this happen? I'm gonna bring this to a close. Why is this important? What is this all about? What does this have to do with Nicodemus? What does this have to do with our text? Because we start seeing a parallel picture. We start seeing a pattern that takes place throughout the Bible. In fact, the Bible has so many wonderful threads through it that in order to understand a lot of it, you need to have read all of it. There's such a beautiful scarlet thread. In fact, what's so interesting is there's a scarlet thread that goes from Genesis to Revelation that there's even a story about a scarlet thread in the Bible. It's amazing. It'll blow your mind if you read it. Let's get back on my subject. Joseph was a little sideways with his father, Jacob, because Joseph was stuck in the natural realm. But if anybody understood the spiritual realm, Jacob did. He understood what it meant. <laughs> he understood that he was dealing with a supernatural realm. Which brings me to say this. Many of us are so keenly aware of the natural world around us. Sadly, some of us are too keenly aware of it. We're aware of our shortcomings and our imperfections. We're acutely aware of our natural failings. Now, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or persona that you tried to project, but we're all born sinful and selfish. <laughs> we're all prone to natural proclivities. We're, we're, we're carnal in our nature. We're sinful in our, we're sinful. We're worldly. David, David the psalmist declared the plight of everyone in Psalms 51 and 5. He says, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Paul addressed the church in Rome with Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. These verses of scripture and many more let us know we are under a death sentence. There is a curse upon each and every one of us no matter 
where you're listening or where you're from or where you're born, on this planet, every human is suffering from the curse of sin and are facing a death sentence. These scriptures are death sentences to us if we remain tied only to our first birth. They describe the plight of all humanity if we only ever experience the first birth. Sadly, it is a proclamation of hopelessness. It is a declaration of the state of being lost. It is a reminder that everyone needs a remedy for our situation. All have sinned. Adding to that, we have an enemy that will not stop bringing up our record of wrongs. He will not stop accusing us before God. Every little thing you've ever done, every little thing you ever did, anything you said. The Bible tells us in Revelations 12 and 10, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Because we were all born in sin, and shaping in iniquity. We have the birth defect. We have the sin, the disease that curses every one of us. Sin has found its resting place in all our lives. That curse of sin has infected each and every one of us. The curse of sin follows in all our family's lineage. What to do when you're born in sin and shape and iniquity? What do you do when you're born with a birth defect? What do you do when I was born this way? I was born with this condition. I was born with the proclivity to be a liar, a scoundrel, a cheat. Look around the room. Everybody here is born with the disease. God has a plan to reverse the curse. God has made a way to break through the barrier of our first birth. He, he has a plan to reverse the curse uh, as the sin and problems uh, start to mount up against us and we start to realize what am I going to do about the sin in my life as the afflictions and the troubles and the problems that we all face mount up. Our first birth binds us to our sin. Our first birth holds us to that curse of death. And we all face the sin and the curse of our first birth. But God has a plan. Don't get ahead of me, Abraham. I got a remedy coming. I, God has a promise for everyone. And he told Nicodemus, marvel not. <laughs> There's a second birth that remits you from the curse of the first. There's a plan. It's called being born again. Hey, Nicodemus, that's why I'm telling you, you must be born again, Nick. So it starts to make sense why there's a thread throughout the Old Testament that against all the birthrights, the second birth took preeminence over the first. It makes sense now why God chose Abel over Cain. We can understand now why God wanted Isaac over Ishmael. And we can see why Ephraim was chosen over Manasseh. We can see why Jacob, <laughs> the liar, the supplanter, would cross his hands <laughs> to extend them 
to the second born over the first. It makes sense why God chose to be in covenant with the second birth over the first. It's a picture of our spiritual birth over our natural birth. It was a foretelling of things to come. It's an important to look at scripture through the light of the writer Paul who was the murdering Saul killing people in the book of Acts. Guilty. But he makes a statement to the Corinthians in chapter 6, 7 through 11. Now therefore, <laughs> there was utterly a fault among you because you go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul knew. Be not deceived and neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's the same term that Jesus used to Nicodemus. Folks, Houston, we have a problem. Paul understood it and he understood it well because he experienced a new birth, a born again back in Acts. And so he's talking to these people. And he goes on. Paul, who got born again in Acts chapter 9, declares the remedy for the curse, which I just read. And such were some of you. What do you mean? What happened for them? How did they break the curse? How did they stop the, the penalty of sin? But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Notice that Jesus said unto Nicodemus, you got to be born of water and the Spirit. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm glad I've been born again. I'm glad I've been baptized in the only saving name. I'm not here to argue. You want to be baptized in titles? Go ahead. You won't find anybody baptized in titles in the Word of God. But I'll show you where you were baptized in Jesus' name. I'm glad I've been born again. And there's better to be something about every one of us that's been born again that we need to tell everyone we meet. There's a remedy for your mouth. There's a remedy. Just like Jesus told Nicodemus, marvel not. Don't get confused. Don't get freaked out over the situation. What did he say in John 3 and 1? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. If Jesus can walk up and tell an expert <laughs> in religiosity, if Jesus, he set the example that some of us get to get out of our natural carnal selves, always playing around with the things of the world and lay that down and get back in your second birth and start telling people there's a remedy. There's a remedy for your sin. There's a remedy you don't have to die in your sins. Why is this important? Nicodemus knew of the story of Cain. Nicodemus knows about Jacob and Esau. He knows about Isaac and Ishmael. He knows about Ephraim and Manasseh. He knew all about how the second birth took preeminence than the first. God has given everyone an opportunity to be born again. 
God has made a way to reverse the curse of sin for everybody. God has handed us a way to defeat sin and death. Stop questioning. Stop confusing the issue. Stop creating a problem where there isn't one. Jesus told Nicodemus, marvel not. And if he can get a ruler of one knowledgeable of all that religiousness to get baptized in Jesus' name and to be born again, we can do. We can do. If Jesus said it and Jesus provided it, we need to do it. 1 Corinthians 50, 58, as we stand. Now this I say, brethren, the sin that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? He didn't stop there. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. My first birth should get the privileges. Jesus is the only one that can say, I fought the law and I beat the law. I made a way of escape. <laughs> but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, uh, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I know some struggle with this. Maybe that's why we have to continually repeat, re-preach, re-say, and reteach. But there's going to come a time when there'll be no more preaching. There will be no more teaching. You will not turn around and be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know. There are Bibles available everywhere. You will not be able to say, but I was taught this, I was taught that. Get in your Bible and find a church that preaches the truth, whether it offends your delicate little first birth feelings or not. Well, I got rights. Well, you want those rights? Trust me, your first birth rights will disqualify your chance at your second birth privileges. They hurt my feelings over there. They want me to live for God when I want to live for me. Paul in Acts 19, while he was passing through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? I'll tell you what, there needs to be a resurg resurgence of that question. Someone tells you they're a believer, they tell you you're a Christian, they tell you to go to church, you need to flat out ask, have you received the Holy Ghost? In other words, have you been born again? Have you been born again? Because there's only one way to break the curse of the birth order. You must be born again. In fact, it was so important that he said unto them, 
Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have so, not so much heard as that there be, be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, and he goes back to the water part. Because the water and the spirit matters. Jesus said unto Nicodemus, yeah, it's, it's all works, guys. There's a harmony in the Bible and the truth. The wonderful thing about preaching truth is you don't have to run from any question or problem. It's in there. And he said to them, Undo, then what were you baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Jesus didn't blow the candle out. He didn't discredit John. He said, he said, You know, John verily baptized the baptism of repentance. Repenting is good. Saying unto the people, They should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. He was a prelude to Christ. Now, when they heard this, it all made sense. And they were baptized in the name, not the titles, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, prophesied. I'm sorry if you've allowed the world to temper your feelings about the Word of God, and if tongue scares you, I'm sorry. But I'm thankful for it. Because I know it is the manifestation that when I've yielded myself to God, I can't walk in or out of a church and someone tell me if I'm saved or not. I can go to the book and go into prayer and experience a second birth and know without a shadow of a doubt. There's no doubt in my heart. There's no doubt in my mind. I have been born again. My natural name may be Steve Crow, but I got a new name applied to my life. I got his blood applied. If I'm going to call him Savior, I want to call him Father. I've been adopted into the household of faith. If you've been born again, why don't you lift up your hands and thank God that you've been adopted into the household of faith. Why don't you thank him right now that he's given you a second birth and you can reverse the curse on your life because you've been born again.